So yeah, then I'll move on to my view of the history of the car and where it might be going. Uh, next, I'll cover some of the challenges that we will face in this uh, transition um, and some strategies and approaches we can uh, take in order to allow us to do uh, sustained and, and uh, frequent software updates. And lastly, I'll get into some conclusions and uh, a call to action. Now, I am using automotive as an example uh, in this talk. Uh, mostly because uh, currently I'm involved in a project related to automotive. I also see it as being probably the biggest transformation that's happening. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about, though, can be applied to other industries, uh, whether it be telecommunications or, or personal devices or, or other things. So let's jump right into the cell phone. So this is what phones used to look like. If you used to have one of these in your pocket, Put up your hand, <laughs> pretty much everybody. Now, if you did a software update to one of these devices, put up your hand. So even though it's connected, you know, people always say if as soon as a device is connected, you pretty much have to do software updates. You know, we carried these in our pockets for years. They're fully connected and we rarely ever did software updates to them. Moving to modern technology, the smartphone. Um, I don't even probably need to ask. Everyone probably has one of these in their pockets and probably everyone does software updates on them regularly. Some of us probably even seek out software updates, uh, looking to see when the next release of iOS or, or Android might become available. Um, part of the reason for doing that is that we see value in the software updates. Uh, when we buy a device, it comes with a certain set of features. And unlike most things that we buy in life, when we buy a smartphone, we can actually add value after the fact, after the initial purchase. So moving from feature phones to smartphones was a giant leap for software when it came to, uh, you know, what software was on a device. The feature phone had a very small set of software uh, contributors. It was usually the device manufacturer and a, and a small set of uh, partners and suppliers. Whereas on a modern day smartphone, you have thousands of projects, thousands of developers. It's a much broader ecosystem. And uh, coordinating software updates was, uh, is something that basically makes a modern smartphone uh, uh, what it is today. Uh, so this transition from feature phone to smartphone uh, is, is a good template for uh, what you see with other devices uh, that are currently going through a similar transition. Another reason not only to get new features and functionality is to uh, get your device updated to protect yourself against security. So this chart published by NIST, um, as you can see, covers every year that the modern smartphone exists. And you can see that in any of those years, there was always at least some critical vulnerabilities that, that happened to be reported. Now, a few other notes about this chart. Uh, probably the most immediate thing that people will ask is why is there a giant jump in 2017? Uh, it's actually a fairly uh, unknown phenomenon. Uh, you can Google for this and there's lots of debate as to why this happened, uh, but there is no consensus. So if you want to submit an, a request for papers for a talk, if you can explain why there's a jump in 2017, you'll probably get your paper accepted. Uh, another thing that you'll notice is this chart only represents the year in which a, a, a vulnerability was actually published or reported. Um, vulnerabilities could exist prior to, to when they're reported. So despite your best efforts, when you ship your software, it's already got a vulnerability on day one. Um, so there is a need to update your software uh, and, and to do it uh, in a fairly uh, immediate fashion or at least to do it regularly. Now, this chart does represent uh, vulnerabilities reported in more than, uh, you know, the so more software packages or projects than you're going to use in any product. Uh, but essentially, you can scale the, the y-axis according to how many uh, open source software projects you have. Uh, obviously, the kernel is one of the areas where, where most CVEs are re or many CVEs are reported. So if you're using Linux um, and you have a kernel in your device, uh, you are going to be affected by CVEs, and you do have to have a method in which to mitigate against them. Now, I did want to try to find data on uh, whether or not people actually update their devices because of security, and it was actually a really hard task to do. Uh, as this 
as these pictures show, there's lots of reasons why people update their phones. Uh, breaking their screens, they want to get access to faster networks. Uh, they're better screens or foldable screens, uh, different architectures, or better, better batteries and, uh, and batteries which charge faster. But even though I can't find data on exactly why uh, people update their devices, we can still look at uh, some, of the, some of the data that is available so we can apply that to the automotive space. So this chart from 2016 shows uh, basically people that are going back to buying a new phone why they're why they're buying a new phone uh, it, you know and being asked how long they kept their previous device um, and as you can see here with android phones uh, the average falls into to one and two years if you really squint you know it's two years and very few people are keeping their phones for for over three years i think this has improved since 2016 so i think the chart is slightly out of date um, but still we're talking about scales less than five years Similar for iPhone, uh, slightly better in the iPhone case. You don't have to squint so much to see that uh, people are definitely keeping their phones uh, on average in the two to three year uh, zone. And again, only a small fraction of, uh, of people are keeping their phones longer than three years. So that's a very quick <laughs> summary of what's gone, you know, what's gone on in the smartphone world. Um, all of us, again, use smartphones, so I'm sure there was no surprises there. But let's see what happens when we apply that to the automotive space um, and, and see what kind of parallels we can establish and whether or not there's any differences that we should be aware of. So I'm using a, a personal example here uh, to demonstrate where cars are coming from. Uh, so this is actually a recall notice for my 2014 Santa Fe. Um, and as you can see uh, in the part that I highlighted in the box, uh, Hyundai will perform a software update to the ECU of your vehicle, uh, the ECU in this case being the engine control unit. Um, so essentially, I had to drive my car to the Hyundai dealership where some person had to open up the hood, plug in a device, do a firmware update, and after they did that, I was able to drive my car home. This isn't the exception. This is the rule right now for the global uh, vehicle fleet. Uh, even though there are cars that are able to do updates now, uh, it, for the majority of vehicles out in, in, on the roads today, this would be a similar scenario. So basically the software in your vehicle rarely ever gets updated. It often will be the same software running on the day you get your car and the day it gets crushed. This is a statement found in an article in the Wall Street Journal. And you can sort of see from here where uh, some analysts think the cars are going. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, but anyhow, it's, I thought it was still a good quote. Uh, so car companies are trying to take a century old business model, make a car, sell it, and hope the customer comes back years later to buy another one. So that's where we were and where we're going. Uh, they're, increasing develop, they're increasingly developing vehicles as digital devices with the ability to remotely beam new services features to the car that can make it easier and more fun to use. So similar to your phone, when you buy your car, it will have a set of features and possibly over the life of the car, uh, you might get more features uh, that make driving better. A good example of that is uh, Tesla full self-drive. They constantly uh, push out new features and, and new versions of full self-drive. And for people that uh, like to have someone else drive their car, uh, that's seen as a, a value add and people will want to get that update and, uh, and employ it. As I said, that quote's a little bit out of date. Uh, this is some, some quotes from an article in uh, 2021 uh, in, Ro in Reuters, Reuters sorry. Um, and uh, it's uh, in response to a uh, press release from Ford. And so here, as you can see, Ford's already got uh, a mil million vehicles capable of receiving over-the-air updates uh, at, so today. Uh, and they also announced some in-vehicle technology stack that allows fully connected and uh, updated software uh, enabling automakers to interact with customers after the vehicle sale. So those two, these two uh, slides basically show where analysts thought they were things were going and Ford being one of the major car manufacturers is uh, showing that, uh, that we're already going there. Now just to address the elephant in the room, 
Yes, I know Tesla has been doing this for many years. Uh, I decided not to talk about Tesla in this talk because Tesla is very known for verticalization. Um, therefore, I don't have many insights into what they're doing uh, inside their uh, inside their software factory. Uh, so I keeping this this talk uh, rather broad, looking at uh, more of the incumbent auto manufacturers that tend to have a, a large uh, diversity in suppliers and and uh, and a large ecosystem in their in their software deliverables. So again, if we look at the the CVE. Uh, the critical vulnerability chart, and uh, and we apply that to uh, the model of automobiles having more Linux in it. We have a larger proportion of the, the CVEs that are going to apply to uh, to vehicles. So CVE mitigation uh, is is highly important, and and again we are affected by that shift in when CVEs are reported and when they're actually in the in the software that we're shipping. Now that's a really important thing to keep in mind um, because there's different truths. So if you take a CVE in the kernel and you apply it to something like banking and someone is able to use a CVE to break into your bank, as a bank customer, you may not ever be affected by that CVE because the bank will use insurance or other means in order to replace any funds that might be stolen. So that CVE, even though the bank will see it as important, you as a user may not because you may not ever see it. Another case would be a CVE applying to your cell phone where you might lose some personal data or pictures. So it might cause you personal injury uh, uh, to your, re your reputational injury, I guess. Um, but again, it, it will have it, its total effects are fairly mild. Now, a CVE in a, in a vehicle can have life threatening consequences uh, if it's exploited, especially if the vehicle's in, in use. So the one thing that we don't get from the CVE chart is just what the impact of a CVE might be to you. And when you think about the fact that CVEs can cause bodily harm um, and that those CVEs might exist in your car, we pretty much have to supply software updates to vehicles for the life of the car. Unlike a phone where, we st where you know, Android One stops after three years, uh, most iPhones stop getting updates. You know, I think the maximum is eight years for, for iPhones, some devices. The vehicle is going to have to have coverage or updates for the entire life of the car. Now, speaking of life of the car, we do actually have very good data on, on that. Uh, so this is data from the European Autom Automobile Manufacturers Association. Uh, you don't have to read the text in the top. I've highlighted the important bits here. So for a car in Europe, 11.8 years is the average use or, or lifetime that it's on the road. For a van, 11.9 years. And for a truck or a lorry, uh, that's 14.1 years. Uh, so comparing that to your, to your cell phone, where we were sort of maxing out at around three years, we're talking significant uh, longer lifespan of the software inside, inside a vehicle. And, uh, and add that to the fact that we have to keep that vehicle up to date for the life of the car. We're, we're talking significant uh, years of, of long-term support. Um, Compared to even some many embedded devices that, uh, that I've had the pleasure to work on, this is a long period of support. Um, Linux is, what, 30 years old now? Uh, so it's uh, overall for a vehicle, when you think about this, we have to go up to 20 years. Uh, that's, that's a long time. So what are some of the challenges we're going to face in doing this? So some of the main software challenges, as you know, for, for something like an automobile, uh, they have to start, it has to be safe, it has to be secure. And again, that has to be from day zero through to the, the day that the vehicle gets crushed. We must have long-term support. Uh, we have to deliver new features and services. Uh, basically, this becomes a, a competition uh, uh, proposition. Uh, as I say, companies like Tesla are giving their buyers additional functionality and value after they drive the car off the lot. Uh, must run on a diversity of software. Uh, so obviously we're not going to be writing software for just a vehicle. So we might even be uh, running on different architectures uh, or different platforms um, as new technologies, because if you might be writing software today that uh, where the tech, the 
actual device that you're running on may not be invented or, or produced for another few years. And finally, we are going to be working in a uh, fairly large ecosystem. Uh, again, with Linux, you, as soon as you start producing a Linux-based de uh, device, you're going to end up using a, quite a large number of packages. And then the other challenge is the lack of precedent, precedence. Uh, so again, the phone is a interesting precedent, but it lacks some of the longevity and commitment from the device manufacturers to, to go for the life of, life of the device. Now, we can change how we view some of these challenges. So must have long-term support. Often when we think about that, we think that we're supporting software from day zero to the last day of the device. However, it just means we have to support the device for the life of the device. We could actually be supporting new software on an old device. All right? so, so we can approach these things differently and again, uh, over-the-air updates is a, is a way to achieve this. Some of the other challenges, if for anyone that supported a device over the long term, uh, you end up having different demands on your development team or actually becomes typically a development and a sustaining team. And when you do that, you always have competition between the development and the, or, or growth and sustaining. Um, usually, uh, there's more interest in developing new features and less interest in, in uh, sustaining them. You have to uh, worry about open source software, uh, either, either the project or releases becoming end of life. Uh, an interesting example of this, that's fairly recent, was the uh, deprecation of Python 2. Um, this will be something that we'll probably face where Python 3 becomes deprecated uh, within the next 15 years or possibly it will go on. Uh, we just don't know. So you have to be prepared for, for open source software to have releases or projects to EOL. Um, and it's constant, uh, you know, like move from IP tables to NF tables. There's always uh, some of these transitions going on. There's also different o OSS uh, release models. So you have branch models, uh, like what the Linux kernel uses, uh, where they'll have an LTS that they'll support for for uh, you know, anywhere from two to five years, sometimes longer. And then you have what I, what I deem or what I've seen called channel, where uh, like Chromium, where basically it is a linear release. They don't have branches where, so you end up getting features as well as bug fixes merged uh, in the next release. And then there's a, what I call value shifting. So basically value shifting is when uh, Corporations basically move from wanting to support old devices and instead focus on, on new devices. So the value shifts from uh, wanting to keep their customers, of, uh, previous customers, happy versus chasing new ones. So those are some of the challenges. Let's look at some of the strategies that we might employ. So design for change is, is a architecture and, and software model that I've used throughout my career. I was uh, fortunate enough to have a professor who was uh, well known for uh, his view on design for change, uh, Dr. David Parnas. Um, and uh, he originally started, and this was before object-oriented programming, uh, he was tasked with writing software for a fighter jet and they weren't sure what hardware they were gonna get for things like uh, radar or other sensors. And they decided what they would do is isolate the code around those changes so that they could, regardless of what radar it was, they would still get the data in the similar format. Um, and this allowed them to swap out one piece of, uh, of hardware for another. Uh, and it resulted in this in object-oriented uh, design or otherwise known uh, to a certain extent as design or build for change. Now, in order to build for change, you do have to uh, plan early, identify things that, you, that might change. You're not going to catch them all, but uh, you can catch many of them. And then you want to isolate your software around the, uh, the areas that might change. Uh, the one rule is that change will always happen. And again, we're talking about 20 year uh, lifespan for, for vehicles. So that's pretty much a given. And then what we do want to do is write software uh, th in the future that we can run on cars that are being released today. 
So having uh, software target multi-generations of, of vehicles. Some of the tactics you can employ for design for change. Uh, you want to make use of standards. So there's informal standards like the kernel ABI. Uh, Linus doesn't like to change the kernel ABI, so it, it tends not to change very often. Uh, formal uh, standards such as POSIX. Uh, libraries, depending on the, the library, you might have to evaluate whether or not it's a long-standing library or if it's new, how, what the chances are that that library is going to continue to exist and or whether the uh, API that the library is going to expose is going to change or remain constant. The, another approach is to decouple modules. Uh, so making use of uh, RPC or messaging. Uh, in automotive, you might be making use of some IP, uh, which allows you to separate uh, functionality and, and decouple modules. Another approach is to have external configurations. Uh, so write a, write a software module that might target various scenarios, and that can be controlled via external configurations. Uh, taking advantage of template and observer patterns, and finally exploiting the language capabilities depending on which language you're, you're making use of. Another big one, uh, which is something that I've been uh, looking more and more into recently, are declarative systems. Um, declarative systems being uh, operating systems that are defined by code. Uh, so typically, if you're download and install Ubuntu, you're then going to make modifications to your installation after the fact. A declarative system, uh, you're going to have all of the modifications captured in code. Uh, Nix OS is a fairly uh, uh, well-known declarative system, but there's, there's quite a few more. Uh, the Elisa project just announced uh, one during a conference a couple weeks ago. Um, it's, it's useful in that, again, it makes you think about change. Uh, and, and you will capture that change in the configuration. Uh, they, most declarative systems will be reproducible. Uh, and minimal change depends on, on again, what you're doing. But uh, because the declarative system requires you to go through a formal code review, uh, it's probably going to make you think and, and uh, really validate what you're, what you're changing from release to release. They're easily tracked. Uh, again, it's in code, so you can put it in Git. Uh, it minimizes upload bandwidth. Uh, that one's a little bit shaky, but again, uh, you're going to be making changes deliberately and not be uh, affected by changes that are happening uh, out of your control. Uh, you can isolate your, your changes uh, by combining uh, your, how, you, how you define your declarative system, you might separate out the hardware component versus uh, uh, software, which has no reliance on hardware. And another thing that it does is it, easy, it eases rollback. Uh, basically, you should be able to roll back just as easily as you roll forward. And another one, uh, robust update frameworks. So I was a little bit disappointed being in almost the last time slot for, for the conference. But actually, I think it works out quite well. There's been some amazing talks at this conference on update frameworks uh, like Rock and others. Um, and I think this category has actually uh, come, out, come along a long way in the last year. Um, and, uh, and it will obviously be uh, the bedrock for any update system. It has to be uh, a robust update framework. Uh, in automotive, some of the challenges might be a little bit uh, larger than uh, the projects presented here. Uh, if you've attended any of the discussions about AB updates and uh, or, or ROC, uh, most of the presenters have talked a little bit about hypervisors or mixed uh, software where you might have a real-time OS providing uh, safety and uh, safety part of the uh, operating system, or sorry, safety part of the overall system. Um, so the, the update systems uh, come, are coming along nicely, but they might have to be extended in order to be fully operational in an automotive environment. Another area where you can uh, put some thought towards is where you're going to target your software. Uh, again, the kernel ABI is, is fairly uh, rigid. However, the kernel itself can have significant changes. So uh, 
things like drivers or code that you keep inside the kernel uh, is probably more likely to change as opposed to software which you're writing for an SDK with a fairly stable API. Again, it depends on the SDK that you're selecting, but uh, SDKs tend to be more stable uh, over time than, than uh, kernel drivers. So you want to target your code to the right area of your system. And if you have to, split them. Uh, you know, if you have something that does some kernel work but does user space, make sure you, you do a, a proper division of the two and, and uh, that way there you can coordinate your, your software and, and isolate your change so that when you, when you do have to change, uh, the changes are, are limited. So finally, we'll jump to some conclusions and a call to action. So I think it's pretty unmistakable that vehicles are becoming digital devices. Uh, every new car I get into, I'm surprised by the giant screens and the functionality, and that's only on the user-facing part of the, the vehicle. Uh, inside the vehicles, it's changing just as much. Uh, again, I'm just starting to, to get more involved in, in an automotive project, and uh, it, it's, a, yeah, it's amazing what's going on inside the, uh, inside the ECUs. Um, it's, if it's a digital device or any of your digital devices, they're going to have to remain safe and secure. Uh, even when you're doing software updates, they, they have to, to remain safe and secure from day one to, to the last day of their, their existence. Um, and delivering new services and features is going to be an important uh, mechanism to ensure that, uh, that, we, that we continue to do uh, software updates. Finally, software should not reduce the vehicle lifespan. And again, software written years from now should be able to run on vehicles shipped today. Um, it's, the, it's the only way, if you think about every, every few years, there's gonna be new vehicle models. There's gonna be more old models that you're supporting than, than new models that you're just about to release. Um, so you really do want your software to be portable across generations. Design and build for change can assist by allowing modules to be reused, uh, time and place. So uh, obviously time, it would be across multiple generations and place could be uh, in, in vehicles with different, uh, so or different uh, SOCs or, or other hardware. Uh, reducing code change when, ha when, it, when it happens. So if you've isolated uh, an area correctly that, that changes when that change does happen, hopefully it results in less code to be, to be modified. You reduce testing. Uh, those modules that don't, get, uh, that don't require updating when change happens usually only require a, a lighter testing regime than the areas that do change. Uh, selecting standards to assist in design uh, building for change. So again, uh, standards and libraries, uh, any interface that doesn't change is, is a good approach to not having to change your software. Uh, update and robust update mechanisms. Uh, I, again, an area that I think we're in good shape, but there is some uh, evolution that still needs to happen there. And all, all of the above will make software updates uh, easier and possible in the, in the future. So finally, a call to action. Uh, so as drivers, passengers, pedestrians, uh, we all have an interest in vehicles remaining safe and secure. Uh, as attendees of this open source summit, we all have an interest in open source software. Um, how can we all combine those two interests to make sure that uh, this endeavor is successful? And with that, I'll open the floor to any questions. Yes. Yes, it might be a trivial question, but in 10 or 15 years, the software will grow bigger and bigger. So will we have enough RAM in the car? To it's, it's not guaranteed that software is going to get bigger and bigger. Um, with, with the declarative systems, uh, you do have control over... So, well, first, a lot of software that we use has been around for 30 years. Right, so like grep, for instance, that that has been in existence since the early days of, of Unix, so the 1970s. Right, um, a lot of a lot of software will be in that sort of uh, vein, and I don't believe that grows or shrinks. 
I've been working with Linux since uh, late 1990s. Um, my systems have definitely gotten bigger, but most of that's been related to uh, desktop Linux. Um, most embedded devices now have significantly uh, grown in the amount of memory that they do have. And I, I would be surprised uh, that you would have enough growth to outgrow uh, RAM or storage. It, using some languages like Golang, if you were to build it, you know, including libc, for instance, yes, if you run more software, you are going to need more space. Um, but it's, it, it, you can still reuse components, even if you're running low on space on an old device, let's say, that's released today. You, you don't have to run all of the new software that's becoming available. You'll, you can still limit it to, your, to the size of your system. Um, like I guess what I'm saying is you're not going to go wild and say that a system 15 years from now, every component you can run on a system that's released today. You'll have to have some discrimination as to which, which software you're able to, to bring back versus software that you're, you're not going to allow. Um, Yeah, but when you so when you had Android and you had 16 gigs of of memory on your phone, you were fairly keen to move to 32 gigs, probably. But when you went from 32 to 64, was that it? It became less important as memory became cheap enough and more uh, more available. So I, I guess what I'm saying is we're not when Android was was moving up from 2010 to 2015. There were significant jumps in the in the size of storage. Those those jumps aren't as important any longer. They're they're they're, they're still important, but they're not as significant. Again, that's just my view. It, um, company may not have interest to support all devices since it only produces cost for the company and um, people don't buy new products. Yeah. Um, do you have ideas about that or are you just... <laughs> it, it's tough. As I was writing this talk, I thought when I wrote the synopsis, I thought I could talk about this and I can for like eight hours, nine hours. The hard part was getting it down to, a, to 40 minutes. Um, so what I was trying to convey is... is as developers, if we can, if we can show value in doing updates, then the corporations will continue to do updates. If value disappears from doing updates, then they're going to want to stop. And I think there's a few things be, that can help with that. One is uh, legislation. I, again, the CVE in a, in a vehicle can potentially be life-threatening. So I think regulation and legislation will have, uh, will have to play a role. We can't have like Samsung stopping doing updates after three years. Um, you know, I, I, I carry a phone which no longer gets security updates. And I know it, I know it bugs me, but 99% of the population it won't. Um, but I think there's a, there is a, a need for us as technology, you know, people involved in technology to help push for um, rethinking and getting corporations to commit to their devices long term. I actually had an interesting debate with a colleague that basically said, with so much technology going into cars, we'll throw them out after four years. And that just, my heart just breaks thinking about it, especially seeing as I think they had a publication that, that the average price that people are spending on a car for a long time was around 25,000 US and it jumped during the pandemic to 40,000. I can't afford forty thousand dollars. That's yeah, ten thousand dollars a year for a vehicle plus all the other. So, you know, another approach, and and again, I I could talk about this a long time. Another approach would be, put a car on a road, and instead of it being in your parking lot in your parking spot for ninety percent of the time, use it as much as you can and wear it out in four years. That would be okay. But 
not the way we use vehicles today. Um, so yeah, it, it is a big challenge and, and I definitely see, um, I would be nervous if I was buying an EV, spending $60,000 knowing how much technology is in it and whether or not that's gonna receive updates uh, 15 years from now. Um, oh, sorry, Joseph, you were first. <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll get you next, Joseph. in the update field, I can totally relate to it, and we are essentially aligned on this. But as somebody who's with the Yocto project for a long time, and I know you are too, um, you mentioned your vision for declarative systems. Yep. So, nerd question now. Wouldn't you consider the Open Embedded slash Yocto stuff a, a declarative system? It is. I think it has some shortcomings, though. So if, if you... Some? <laughs> <laughs> Configuration is the tough one. See, Octo does a great job. You can define your image. You know, I can define exactly what's going into my image in Yocto, but doing configuration, uh, like uh, adding users or adding, uh, you know, other, uh, setting up a container runtime with default containers and stuff like that. So Yocto, Yocto has a, a ways to go. And but I have thought at some point, like again, the declarative systems is something that I've only been thinking of recently. So for a long time, I was, I was more of the mind of like core OS, having a mutable operating system, um, and then adding in via containers or other mechanisms. Um, but I think that approach is, is a little bit... Um, it, it is, and it's difficult to work with. Whereas a declarative system uh, gives you the opportunity to, uh, to make modifications but at least you get a lot of the benefits of an immutable system, but you do have the flexibility to make the changes when you need to. But yeah, Yocto is, I think it's a really good start. I would probably look at having an alternative mechanism instead of local.conf and BB layers and doing that in, in another format. Uh, I'll say YAML if people want to beat me up or, <laughs> or JSON. Um, but uh, you know, I think that would be an interesting add-on to Yocto to be able to do that so that you can have uh, fragments and, and then assemble them and then use that to control your build and your output. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it is relatively new and I'm still mulling through how best to uh, work with it and, and eventually get to something that I could propose to Richard and, and get into Yocto. Before I run out of time, I better ask. Yeah, so so again, like, so I'm a I'm a architect and, and a technologist that is just being bought out by an automotive company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I my expertise is on the operating system side, and again, in the chart in the in the presentation, you'll see that I didn't separate applications and OS, and that again was an apt. Uh, it was a decision I, I had to. I, I opted for this route. I know it's not ideal. I wish if the talk was twice as long, I could have split them better. Um, but yeah, it, now that I, now that we will be owned, we're just waiting for regulatory approval. So we were bought by Aptiv, um, and so I am getting insight into how the automotive industry works, and that that will accelerate as soon as the the deal is complete. And I hope as uh, as an operating system vendor to be able to take like my whole goal is to take any technology that has more than one user and put that into a product. Because if there's a technology that a single user is doing, you know, that's sort of bespoke, there's not a huge value in getting that into an operating system that we, sold, we sell to many customers. But as soon as some, something's done twice, then I like, I, I, it's like, okay, that's something that we can put in the product and there's value. So I'm hoping that our relationship with, with our new owners will give me more insight into that and, and I can help expand our product and, and contribute to Yocto from an automotive perspective. Um, we are working with Ford already, uh, so I have a little bit of insight there, but I'll get more insight with when, I, when I'm working with, uh, with Aptiv directly. Like we got one minute, so one more question or we're done. And people can go to the closing game. <laughs> Control trolling. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much.